pleased and privileged to have as our guest speaker one of the real stars of, uh, of thoracic transplantation, Dr. Kieran Kush, a professor from Stanford. Um, Kieran uh, did her training in Stanford and Harvard and did some um, postgraduate stuff at uh, UCSF. And then uh, during the 19, during the 2000s emerged as one of the uh, one of the leading new figures in uh, heart transplantation. And many of us are familiar with his her work, uh, particularly the work um, recently in cell free DNA and in registry analysis. But she's done she's had uh, over 100 papers. She's had uh, many different types of papers, and she's the uh, the uh, the director of heart research. Um, before we go ahead, we should uh, acknowledge the that the university is located. This is our land acknowledgement, Kieran. The, the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. We'd also like to thank Paladin, Estellas, and AstraZeneca for their support of the ATI seminar series. And please remember everyone to evaluate this session by filling the evaluation form at the end of this of this of the seminar. So Kieran's interests um, uh, I followed with because they overlap many of the interests of all of us um, in in the pathogenesis of primary graft dysfunction after heart transplantation, transplantation, the um, uh, novel genomic markers um, and novel therapies for the prevention of cardiac allograft vasculopathy. And above all, the uh, assays to assess the uh, net state of immunosuppression. But today, she's what she's going to talk to us about is her work. And this began with a very important uh, 2017 paper on, on cell-free DNA. And she'll be talking about the clinical applications of cell-free DNA testing after transplantation. I think everyone at the end of her talk will agree that we should be doing this here. And we want to have access to this technology. So, Kieran, thank you very much for agreeing to give us this seminar. The title of my talk is Clinical Applications of Cell Free DNA Testing After Heart Transplantation. These are my conflicts of interest. I do serve as a scientific advisor for CareDX, which is a medical diagnostics company. I have an NIH grant related to cell free DNA testing and also a patent on a cell free DNA for the diagnosis of infectious complications. So just a general outline, I'd like to start out with some background and historical perspective on cell-free DNA testing. I understand that the audience for this lecture is quite broad, so hopefully this will give us all the same basis to start our discussion. And then I'm going to focus on three key areas in which we can use cell-free DNA in the setting of transplantation. The first is acute rejection. The second is to examine the virome, both to assess the strength of the autoimmune response and also for the diagnosis of infectious complications after transplantation. And finally, I'd like to speak a little bit about cell-free DNA and its potential for detection and monitoring of post-transplant malignancy. And I'll end with a few remarks on the exciting directions in which I think this technology is moving. So to start out, cell-free DNA is a very powerful biomarker. Basically, this is DNA that's released from nucleated cells either by normal cell turnover or apoptosis, or cell lysis or cell death called necrosis. And it can be found in any body fluid, whether it's plasma, urine, saliva, or CSF. And it can be genomic or mitochondrial DNA, coding or non-coding. The length can vary quite a bit. And it's a very um, real-time biomarker because cell-free DNA is cleared from the blood by the liver and the kidneys with a half-life of about 15 minutes to several hours. It really reflects cell turnover within the body at a particular snapshot in time. So a little bit of a historical perspective. So the presence of extracellular nucleic acids in the blood was first described by Mandel, a French scientist in the late 1940s. In 1966, the high levels of DNA were identified in the plasma of patients with lupus especially during flares of the disease. So it's thought to originate from tissue breakdown. In the 1970s, cancer patients were found to have higher cell-free DNA levels than healthy controls. And the field really blew open in 1997 with the discovery of free fetal DNA in the maternal blood during pregnancy. 
And this landmark discovery was made by Dennis Lowe, who's a professor in Hong Kong. And remember him because we'll get back to him at the end of my lecture. So in 2010, my colleague at Stanford, Stephen Quake, developed one of the first cell-free DNA assays for prenatal testing. And by now, this technology is used widely. Some of you may have had cell-free DNA assays during pregnancy to screen for fetal chromosomal abnormalities. And this blood test has largely replaced amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling to screen for fetal genetic abnormalities. And so in thinking about this assay, where you're detecting DNA from the fetus in the mother's blood, we started thinking about parallels with transplantation, where maybe you could detect DNA from the donor in the recipient's blood, and maybe higher levels of DNA from the donor could reflect injury to the breast. And so this is really where our work in acute rejection in heart transplantation and lung transplantation really started. So this was around 2007, 2008, where we started to talk to Steve Quake about the possibility of looking for DNA from the transplant donor in the recipient's blood and seeing whether it could be a biomarker of acute rejection. So we started out by doing a very small pilot study using bank samples we had on a cohort of heart transplant patients with and without rejection. And what we did was we collected cell-free DNA from these banked plasma samples, and we sequenced it. And the theory was if we could identify differences in the donor and recipient sequences by a shotgun sequencing, we could then quantify the amount of DNA coming from the donor in the recipient's blood and monitor it over time to see if it goes up in the setting of rejection. So we actually received a, a challenge grant from the NIH, this was back in 2010, where we prospectively enrolled 160 heart transplant recipients, both adult and pediatric. And we started out by collecting blood from the donor and the recipient at the time of transplantation and genotyping or sequencing the donor and recipient to determine their sequence differences. And then after transplantation, we collected serial blood samples from the recipient and purified and sequenced the recipient's cell-free DNA and identified donor cell-free DNA, calculated the donor fraction, and compared it to biopsies and other clinical data. And what we found was that in the first few days after the heart transplant, there were very high levels of DNA from the donor in the recipient's blood. And this is not surprising because there's a fair amount of graft injury that occurs in the setting of organ procurement, and cold storage and transport and ischemia reperfusion injury. But what we also observed was that this donor DNA was rapidly cleared from the recipient's blood and starting at several days after transplant fell to very low levels in the absence of rejection and stayed at very low levels in the stable state without any rejection. However, what we did find was that in patients with cellular rejection, whether it was moderate or severe, we saw significant increases in the amount of DNA coming from the donor organ in the recipient's blood. And this was also true for antibody-mediated rejection. And this isn't surprising because both processes cause graft injury and graft damage and release of DNA from the graft into the recipient's blood. And so this is a highly sensitive marker of graft injury regardless of the underlying cause. So what we found, and this paper was published back in 2014, was that overall we found higher donor-derived cell-free DNA levels in the patient's blood in the setting of clinically significant acute rejection. Interestingly, we also found that donor-derived cell-free DNA levels started to go up weeks to months before rejection was picked up on biopsy. And we now know that by the time cell death is seen on biopsy, it's often very late in the process of, the, um, of immune activation and the autoimmune response, and that graft injury is probably occurring at a much earlier time point. And so the beauty of this, these molecular tests is that they can actually detect very early graft injury even before changes are seen on biopsy. And so I'd like you to keep that in mind because we'll be getting back to that concept a little bit later. So we've all seen cases where uh, genomic studies at one institution seemed very promising but didn't translate to other centers or couldn't be replicated. So one of the first things we did is a validation study. 
And so uh, one of my uh, mentors and colleagues at Stanford, Dr. Hannah Valentine, moved to the NIH and established a, um, a laboratory there uh, on, on the Genomic Research Alliance for Transplantation. And so what we did, Hannah, in, in collaboration with Sean Osborne-Eno, who's a lung transplant physician, basically repeated the, the um, experiments we had done using plasma samples from heart transplant patients with and without acute rejection that we had tested at Stanford. And they performed the same series of investigations in their laboratory and compared their results to ours. And what we found was that the results were identical. And so this is a very simple and reproducible assay to detect donor DNA in the recipient's blood. And so they went on to do a multi-site validation study involving five heart transplant centers on the East Coast, and their results were very similar to ours. So they showed that donor-derived cell-free DNA goes up in the setting of acute rejection after heart transplantation, whether it's cellular or antibody-mediated, and the amount of donor-derived cell-free DNA correlates with the severity of graft dysfunction. And as you can see here, the test performance was excellent for acute rejection detection. They also made some other very interesting observations. So they saw um, that the donor-derived cell-free DNA levels start to rise earlier in the setting of antibody-mediated rejection compared to cellular rejection, and also that the cell-free DNA fragment lengths were a little bit shorter in AMR compared to ACR. So this really started the discussion about whether some of these non-invasive tests could actually eventually distinguish different rejection subtypes, such as ACR and AMR, which would be very helpful because right now we still do a confirmatory biopsy to determine the rejection subtype when these uh, screening assays are abnormal. So this technology has really evolved quite a bit over the past 10 years. So the initial research-grade assays that we used at Stanford and at other uh, sites basically involved genotyping the donor and genotyping the recipient and comparing their sequence differences. So that's a very time and labor um, intensive process. It's also costly. Eventually, clinical assays were developed that used targeted amplification of SNPs that does not require genotyping of the donor or recipient, which we'll talk about in a minute. And also, um, our group at Stanford developed this uh, informatics algorithm called the One Genome Method that can dis can discriminate donor from recipient after sequencing of the recipient only. And this is the technique that's being used by a company called Viracore Eurofins to develop their um, cell-free DNA assay called Viracore Track. So along with this, there were um, developments in automated uh, sequencing with much improved efficiency with an automated workflow. So as you probably know, we now have automated nucleic acid isolation, library prep, and sequencing, and informatics pipelines that have basically increased the through, uh, throughput and uh, the workflow of these assays tremendously and has also reduced cost. And so these developments in the technology really set the stage for development of clinical donor-derived cell-free DNA assays that can be used real-time for patient monitoring and patient care. And I think it's really quite remarkable that in a span of 10 years, these donor-derived cell-free DNA assays went from the initial concept to clinical use for our patients in real time. And so the first clinical assay that was developed was called Allosure, and this is by a company called CareDX based in South San Francisco. And basically what this Allosure assay is, is it's very simple. So heart transplant recipients go to a local laboratory and have their blood drawn, and the blood's drawn into these um, special tubes called struct tubes that have a proprietary ingredient that stabilizes their white blood cells, so they don't release genomic DNA. These tubes can then just be kept at room temperature and shipped to the lab at CareDX, where they've developed a panel of 405 highly polymorphic SNPs. So these are sites in the genome that vary a lot from uh, individual to individual. And so if you just sequence at these 405 sites, you can use informatics algorithms to then determine which fragments are coming from person A and which fragments are coming from person E person B. And so you can discriminate donor and recipient cell-free DNA. And the beauty is that it works even with two related individuals, such as a living kidney transplant donor and recipient. 
And then this informatics pipeline calculates the donor fraction, and that's the result that's transmitted back to the transplant center after 48 to 72 hours. So it's a turnaround time of two to three days. This is a clinically useful assay. So we first studied the clinical utility and validity of this Alishore assay in a prospective study that was done about seven or eight years ago. This was called the DOR registry, and it was conducted at 24 heart transplant centers in the US enrolling 760 heart transplant patients. And basically we collected thousands of blood samples from these patients and we did cell free DNA sequencing and paired these results with biopsies. There were uh, 18 AMRs and 17 ACR events. And what we found was that in the absence of acute rejection, the median donor-derived cell-free DNA level is very low, around 0.06% in the patient's blood. And you might notice here that there are some outliers, and these are um, uh, test results I'd like you to keep in mind, and we're gonna talk about these more a little bit later. And we also found that levels are very stable up to at least two years post-transplant. But what we did find was that in the setting of acute rejection, the donor-derived cell-free DNA levels were significantly higher than the quiescent state, and that the amount of donor-derived cell-free DNA in the blood went up in correlation with the severity of acute rejection. And this is true for both cellular and antibody-mediated rejection. And this makes a lot of sense intuitively, because as rejection becomes more severe, there's more graft damage, there's more cell death, and more DNA is released from the donor organ. And so this makes a lot of sense just intuitively. We also found that in patients with graft dysfunction who had negative biopsies, the donor-derived cell-free DNA level was significantly higher. And so this suggests for the first time that these cell-free DNA assays might actually be more sensitive for graft injury and rejection than the biopsy. And I think this has really turned the paradigm on its head where the biopsies used to be considered the gold standard for rejection monitoring. And now we're starting to question that assumption because these molecular assays may actually be more sensitive for graft injury. So overall, the test performance of Alishore from the DOR registry was as follows. At a threshold of 0.2%, the area under the curve was 064 you can see here the sensitivity, the high specificity, and probably most important for screening tests is the negative predictive value, which is very high at 97%. So if a patient has this non-invasive screening test for acute rejection and it falls below this threshold, you can be 97% confident that they don't have acute rejection and hopefully avoid biopsies, which is basically the way that it's being used by my center at Stanford and at centers uh, across the US now. Just in looking at the data recently, about 90% uh, of heart transplant centers in the US are now using these cell free DNA assays for patient monitoring. And our protocol at Stanford is to only do two routine biopsies within the first month after heart transplant. And then all of our patients get switched over to non invasive screening, which has really reduced our um, need for biopsies. So what are some common clinical questions that have emerged about use of this assay for acute rejection monitoring? So one is all of those high levels with a negative biopsy. What do they mean? Well, what we have seen is that the donor-derived cell-free DNA levels from large registry studies performed in, in the US, including the CHOR registry, the levels start to go up about two months prior to biopsy-proven rejection. So this is probably reflecting early graft injury and graft damage. And so the way I think about it now is if the levels start to go up, even if the biopsy is negative, I still get worried, I still get concerned that there may be some immune activation and graft damage occurring, and I may start to augment my maintenance therapy or maybe even start empiric treatment if I'm concerned about the development of acute rejection. Um, and we now know so donor-derived cell-free DNA levels start to go up with the development of de novo donor-specific antibodies after transplantation. And I think this is important because a lot of us do screen routinely for development of de novo DSAs after transplant. We know that they're associated with worse long-term outcomes, but often we don't know what to do about them when we find them. Should we treat or should we not? And so now what I do in my practice is I do a donor-derived cell-free DNA assay. And if it's elevated, 
suggest that the CSAs may be causing some graft injury and I may go ahead and start some treatment. So I think this can help us risk stratify our DSAs and help guide patient management in that respect. Many people have asked me about cardiac allogram vasculopathy, which is a form of chronic rejection after heart transplant, and do cell-free DNA levels go up in that setting? And so far, the data has been mixed, uh, certainly not conclusive, but they've all been very small studies. So there's a study at the University of Chicago involving 65 heart transplant patients, which showed that patients with CAV tend to have higher donor dry cell-free DNA levels than with those without CAV. But there was a subsequent study uh, that was published out of Madrid, Spain, using uh, data from 94 patients. And this was using a different cell-free DNA assay, the viral urofins assay, showing that patients with different severity of CAV did not have significantly different donor-derived cell-free DNA levels. And we actually just did a similar study at Stanford and Intermountain, where we had almost 70 patients with different grades of vasculopathy. We did cell-free DNA sequencing using Allosure and did not detect any significant differences in their levels. But I'd like to qualify that with the knowledge that most of the patients with CAV were asymptomatic and still had normal graft function. And so it may be interesting to actually repeat the study looking specifically at patients with CAV who are starting to develop graft dysfunction because these are the patients who are more likely to have ischemia and graft injury and release cell-free DNA. So probably more coming on this particular clinical question. So what are some exciting directions that uh, cell-free DNA is moving towards in terms of acute rejection? So there is a data from this graft consortium run by the NIH showing that black patients have higher donor-derived cell-free DNA levels in the first week after transplant compared to non-black patients. And we know that black patients tend to have more race mismatch, more HOA mismatch between the donor and recipient. So could this be an early clue about the worst transplant outcomes that we um, have seen for years in our black patients? And one question this has brought up, which I think is fascinating, is could donor drive cell free DNA in itself be a trigger for subsequent immune activation and graft injury? So, is it not only a biomarker, but actually a mediator of the autoimmune response? And I'll get back to this a little bit later. There's also been a lot of work looking at tissue specific methylation. So, can we identify the tissue type that the cell free DNA is coming from? And I think this is really important in the case of multi-organ transplants. So for example, we can't do donor-derived cell-free DNA level uh, testing at this time in patients with multi-organ transplants, heart liver, uh, heart lung, heart kidney, because we can't tell which organ the cell-free DNA is coming from. And we know that different organs release different amounts of cell-free DNA at the steady state due to or differences in organ size and vascularity and cell turnover. So for example, a stable heart transplant recipient has donor-derived cell-free DNA levels of less than 0.2%. For lungs, it may be less than 1%. For livers, they may have levels of up to 5% in the stable state. And so you can't really use these assays for monitoring for rejection in heart liver patients, for example, because if you had a level of 3%, is that acute rejection of the heart or is that because they have a normal healthy liver transplant? But if we're able to detect which tissue type or which organ the cell-free DNA is coming from, then we may actually be able to use these assays in the setting of multi-organ transplant. And importantly, these assays may also shed light on the etiology of graft injury. Um, so I think there's a lot more work to come in this area. Okay, this is a little bit off topic in that it's not about cell-free DNA, but there's been some complementary work in microRNAs. And so Pollock Shah at Innova Fairfax has led this work where basically he did a very similar series of experiments where he isolated and sequenced microRNAs or small RNAs in heart transplant and showed that there are panels of microRNAs that are differentially expressed in the setting of acute rejection. And actually, he found that there are different microRNAs that are present at higher levels in cellular and antibody-mediated rejection. And so then he developed algorithms that could differentiate cellular from antibody-mediated rejection based on the microRNAs 
patterns. And so this work is currently undergoing further validation, but I think it's a very promising avenue for investigation. And again, may help us distinguish different injury phenotypes um, through non-invasive means. So now I'd like to move uh, to a different topic, which is diagnosing infectious complications after transplant using cell-free DNA testing. So as you all know, we always walk this tightrope in managing our transplant patients. If we over immunosuppress them, they may develop infectious complications, malignancies, et cetera. And if we under immunosuppress, they may develop acute rejection. And that therapeutic window that we're trying to target is very narrow and can vary between patients. And so, you know, one of the holy grails in transplantation is to try to develop an assay that allows us to assess the overall state of the autoimmune response and tell us, are you within that therapeutic window or not? And that type of assay has really eluded us to date, but a lot of important work is being done in this area. So one observation we made when we're initially sequencing our patient cell-free DNA was that about 2% of the cell-free DNA was non-human. And these came from um, microbes, viruses, and fungi. And so we started doing a really a deeper dive into some of these sequences and aligning them with reference databases, trying to figure out what types of, of microbes are present in our patient's blood. And we found a lot of viral sequences. And what we did was we um, identified the types of viral sequences present in a transplant patient's blood. And we found that a lot of these sequences came from a type of virus called anelloviruses or torquetinoviruses. And at that time, I had never heard of these viruses before. And I subsequently learned that these are ubiquitous viruses. They're found in the blood of 95% of healthy people. And they're not known to cause any particular disease but they do replicate in the setting of immunosuppression. And previous studies had shown that in patients with HIV, as they progress towards AIDS, the amount of torquetinovirus or anelovirus sequences in their blood really increases dramatically. And we saw the same thing in our transplant patients. So what we did was we compared the anelovirus loads in our patient's blood to their immunosuppressive drug levels. In this case, it's tacrolimus. And you can see is that as patients Tacrolimus levels became higher as they became more immunosuppressed, the relative amount of anelovirus in their blood increased. And as we treated with antiviral drugs such as valgancyclovir, which target herpes viruses, the amount of these virus viral sequences in the patient's blood went down. So we were actually able to get a very interesting snapshot of our patient's virome by sequencing their cell-free DNA. And so what we found was that at the time of transplant, our patients had a lot of different viral uh, sequences in their blood. But over time post-transplant, as they became very highly immunosuppressed, the anelloviruses really predominated. And then as we weaned their immunosuppression over time post-transplant, the relative amount of anelovirus decreased. And so our thought was, could the amount of anelovirus in our patient's blood be a marker of their overall level of immunosuppression? And so what we did was we compared anelovirus levels in patients who had rejection, who were under immunosuppressed, and those who did not have rejection. And we found that levels were lower in patients with acute rejection, in patients who were under immunosuppressed, and higher in non-rejecting patients. So overall, this suggests that anelovirus could be used as a marker of patients' net state of immunosuppression. So I think this is a really interesting line of investigation, and hopefully more work will be done in this area to develop assays we can use to assess how immunosuppressed our patients are. We also then looked at all these different microbial sequences we found in our patient's blood and correlated it with clinical, with uh, PCR assays performed for our clinical lab. And we found that for some common organisms like CMV and Pseudomonas, the sequencing from cell-free DNA correlated very, very well with clinical lab test results. So what this suggests was this kind of shotgun sequencing-based approach could actually be used to diagnose or to screen for infectious complications after transplantation. And so then what we did was we went back to the plasma samples of our lung transplant patients who came into the hospital with infections that were never diagnosed clinically. 
And what we found is that in these patients, we found very high levels of different viruses in their blood, like adenoviruses, polyomaviruses, herpes viruses. And so what this suggests is that maybe these assays, these cell-free DNA assays, could just perform a broad screen for different infections. And we may actually be able to identify infections that we couldn't have with the targeted assays that we order from our clinical labs. Now, can we cast a very wide net and see what we find instead of kind of thinking clinically about the tests that we need to order a priori? And so one of the um, postdocs who worked with us on this study actually started a company called Carius that does just that. They have developed a, a sequencing-based assay to screen for infectious complications after transplantation. And this is a clinically available assay now. I've also worked a little bit with CareDX to develop another sequencing-based assay for infectious complications called ID. It's still in development, but this is one really interesting case I wanted to highlight. We had a heart transplant patient who developed blurry vision and visual loss after transplant. And we found evidence of toxoplasmosis in his vitreous fluid. And when we went back through some of the banked plasma samples we had on this patient, we found toxoplasma DNA detected by this ID sequencing assay in his blood 13 days before he presented clinically. And the serum PCR testing done in our hospital for toxoplasma at that time was actually negative. So this suggests that there may be some very interesting ways to, to screen for and diagnose infections in our transplant patients, who often have very unusual infection using sequencing-based assays. So finally, I'd like to get to the third part of my talk, which centers on cancer monitoring, which is, I think is really a very exciting field to move into. So as you may know, cancer is one of the leading causes of death after transplantation by about 10 to 15 years post-transplant. And the incidence of cancers is much higher in transplanted patients compared to um, non-transplant um, patients. And there's some cancers that are very common, skin cancers, post-transplant lymphomas, and others. And this is because the immune system also surveys against cancer. And so when we suppress the immune system, these cancers tend to flourish. And so there has been a, a great interest in using cell-free DNA to potentially monitor for some of these post-transplant malignancies. And this is called the liquid biopsy. And it's basically analysis of circulating DNA from tumors or from cancer cells for cancer diagnosis, monitoring, and prediction or monitoring of response to therapy. And, and circulating tumor DNA assays have actually been uh, developed and tested quite extensively in the field of oncology already. And there's many different um, approaches for using circulating tumor DNA assays. You could use them as a diagnostic test for early detection of cancer or for monitoring of minimal residual disease. You could use them as predictive assays to assess the molecular composition of tumors, which may help you determine the best targeted therapy to use or to assess for treatment response. And then they may have prognostic value as well. So I've been lucky enough to correlate with an investigator named Asha Lizade here. At, he's an oncologist, uh, lymphoma specialist here at Stanford, who does a lot of work on circulating tumor DNA. And Asha and his group have developed this technique called CAP-Seq, where they make panels of, of uh, cancer-specific mutations that they've identified from the literature, from prior studies, and from sequencing our patients' tumors. And so they've developed panels to screen for lymphomas, for lung cancers, and for other uh, cancers. So we used some of these panels to screen for post-transplant lymphomas in our patients who are diagnosed with PTLD. And these are just a few representative cases. This was a lung transplant patient who was diagnosed with PTLD several months post-transplant. The blue line represents the amount of circulating tumor DNA from his lymphoma that we found in the blood. And you can see here that the circulating tumor DNA was detected about a month and a half before his clinical diagnosis. And this is really important for PTLDs because they often present very late and they can be associated with a very poor prognosis. So you wanna to try to detect these cancers early. This is another lung transplant patient with PTLD in which we're able to detect circulating tumor DNA in her blood a year before she was diagnosed clinically. We can also use these assays to monitor PTLD with treatment 
So in this patient who had PCLD, uh, he was treated with rituximab. The circulating tumor DNA levels fell appropriately, and then he had a recurrence as shown here, and he was then treated with RCHOP, and the circulating tumor DNA levels went back uh, to, to undetectable. So this represents a, a way to monitor therapy using circulating tumor DNA. And then at the same time, you can always monitor the donor fraction. This is a patient with PTLD who is receiving chemotherapy. So we really scaled back on her immunosuppression, and she subsequently developed acute rejection, as you can see here, from the donor fraction. So we've gone ahead and established an international consortium to do a study that's funded by the NIH developing these um, circulating tumor DNA assays to screen for uh, cancer-related complications after transplant. And so see, these are some of the patient samples that we've studied showing that we can detect circulating tumor DNA from patients diagnosed with PTLD, and we can uh, detect PTLD DNA months to a year before the clinical diagnosis. So I think this is um, hopefully very promising and uh, more to come in the next few years. So this has really been an exciting field for me to work in and a very rapidly growing field. So one, one kind of topic I'd like to get back to, which has really uh, interested me of late, is whether cell-free DNA is not only a marker of graft injury, but also a mediator of graft injury. And this is a figure from a recent review article that I just wrote uh, with Dr. Valentine. And basically, if you think about the process of organ transplantation, the graft undergoes a fair amount of damage during procurement and cold storage, and then there's ischemia reperfusion injury, such that there's a lot of cell death by apoptosis and necrosis after transplant and release of cell-free DNA into the blood. And there's a mounting body of evidence that the cell-free DNA actually acts as what's called a damage-associated molecular pattern that binds to receptors on cells involved in the adaptive and innate immune response and activates these cells and causes release of cytokines and other inflammatory mediators such that cell-free DNA is actually a mediator of the autoimmune response and not just a bystander. And so we're actually writing a grant now to look at cell-free DNA as a mediator of the autoimmune response and whether it may account for the worst outcomes after transplantation in black patients compared to white patients, because we know that black patients have higher cell-free DNA levels uh, after transplantation. The number of publications on, on cell-free DNA and transplant has really skyrocketed in the last few years, starting with that initial donor-derived cell-free DNA proof of concept study that we published in 2010. So there's been really an exponential rise over the last few, few uh, years, reflecting growing interest and, and a growing body of work in this field, which I think is just wonderful and, and speaks to the potential of this technique to hopefully not only improve um, detection of post-transplant complications, but help guide our management and our treatment and help us personalize therapy for our patients. So getting back to Dennis Lowe, who I mentioned in the beginning as uh, first detecting fetal DNA in the maternal blood, Dennis Lowe won the Lasker Award in 2022. This is considered to be a prequel in some ways to the Nobel Prize. It's a very high scientific honor. And this really is a recognition of the increasing importance of uh, cell-free DNA uh, testing and scientific discoveries in this field. And so finally, conclusions and future directions. I hope I've shown you that donor-derived cell-free DNA enables a non-invasive monitoring for acute rejection after solid organ transplantation, and hopefully eventually will give us insight into different types of acute rejection and tissue of origin. The anelovirus loads could be used to measure overall levels of immunosuppression and help us better titrate immunosuppression in our patients on an individual or personalized basis. And non-human DNA can be sequenced to screen for and diagnose infectious complications after transplant. And finally, circulating tumor DNA can be used for early detection and monitoring of post-transplant malignancy. So this is a figure from a review article that I recently wrote with Palak Shah and Jason Goldberg and other colleagues 
where we try to summarize where we are now with molecular diagnostics, which I think are really revolutionizing the field of transplantation. Year on year, there's more molecular diagnostic assays being developed and tested and studied. We now have donor-derived cell-free DNA. We have antibodies such as DSAs and non-HOA antibodies. Um, mRNA, um, like the gene expression profiling tests we have for heart transplant, microRNAs, these protein biomarkers in development, and they all have different uses to screen for different types of complications after transplant. And I really do think that these tests can be very complementary. So perhaps by doing a panel of these non-invasive tests at once, we can screen for multiple post-transplant complications at the same time in a non-invasive manner, pick up complications early, and hopefully do a better job of managing our patients, preventing long-term complications and adverse outcomes, and really personalizing therapy for transplant patients, which at this time we really don't do very well. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the many people uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with, who've contributed to this work, who've um, taught me and mentored me over the years. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for your very kind invitation to speak to your group today uh, and for your attention. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. This has been an outstanding lecture. I know there'll be many questions. So uh, maybe I could just uh, call for um, call for questions right now. Maybe I could start in um, in countries outside the United States. There have been um, there have been challenges with providing these tests um, within the constraints of a global uh, global health budget rather than the health budget that can be incrementally increased for expensive new tests. So do you see a direction for this to be made more widely available at a lower cost? For example, starting with the cell-free DNA assay in monitor in, in, as a screening test for transplantation, what would you say to um, to the world that is looking to access this science but can't afford um, the prices that are currently charged? Yes, yeah, so I think I have kind of two thoughts about that question. One is that these sequencing-based assays should not be expensive. Now, technically, sequencing can be done at any clinical lab with, with a sequencer, even some of the desktop sequencers now. So for example, here, DX has developed a different version of its donor-derived cell-free DNA assay called AlloSeq that is available now mainly in the research context in some centers in Europe. And basically, it's an assay. It's a much smaller SNP panel. Instead of 405 SNPs, I think there's 100-something SNPs. But it can be done at any local hospital lab. And then they share the informatics algorithm that is uh, used to calculate the donor fraction. And so this assay is much simpler and much cheaper. And so over time, I think we will develop easier and simpler and cheaper cell-free DNA sequencing assays that can hopefully be used more broadly. I know there's several companies in India that have already developed very cost-effective and accurate donor-derived cell-free DNA assays. My second thought in response to that question is that hopefully these assays can actually reduce downstream medical costs. Because right now, a lot of our long-term costs from the care of our patients comes from managing long-term complications like kidney failure or infections or malignancies. And if we can use these molecular diagnostics to better titrate and individualize our immunosuppression, hopefully we can prevent these complications from occurring and reduce downstream costs. And so my hope is that ultimately by using molecular diagnostics, we can improve patient outcomes and prevent these adverse events from occurring. Excellent. Um, Laura, you must have some thoughts after seeing this, and I know you've been close to Kieran for a long time. Um, any comments? Yes. <laughs> thank you, Phil. Um, terrific talk, Kieran. As always, thank you for walk walking us through the, the history of this as well, because it's really a fascinating history. I, I have two questions for you. W one um, is kind of related to Phil's question. Um, I wonder if you could speak to the positive predictive value of uh, cell free donor derived cell free DNA testing and weighing that against, as Phil says, the the benefits of a rather expensive test um, to the positive predictive value as opposed to the negative mm -hmm. predictive 
particular value. And the, the second question I had is, um, what are the implications of sex in, um, or, or are there any, both the sex of the patient you're testing, but also whether they've had a, um, the sex of the donor organ um, in relation to the, the donor derived elements? Thanks. Yeah, great question. So as I had mentioned, the test has a very high negative predictive value. But when we looked at, and this is data that we actually were just looking at a few days ago from the SHORE registry. SHORE is a very large prospective registry study that we've been working on in the US involving 67 heart transplant centers. We enrolled almost 3,000 heart transplant patients and did allo sure cell free DNA testing and allo map gene expression profiling testing on these patients. So right now we're in the process of analyzing all this data, but what it's shown, and, and these data will be presented at ISHLT 2024 in Prague, is that if you have positive non-invasive testing, whether it's with the cell free DNA assay alone or in combination with gene expression profiling, the likelihood ratio for finding acute rejection and biopsy increases. And I think the likelihood ratio was on the order of about 3.5. So basically what it does is these non-invasive tests allow us to better select the patients who need biopsies. So as you know, when we do routine biopsies, most of these routine biopsies don't show any rejection. So we get a lot of negative biopsies. And with that, there's the risk of complications associated with biopsies. Now, with these non-invasive tests, we can really decide which patients need to have a biopsy based on the non-invasive test. So the biopsies we do are, are much better informed in terms of their selection and are more likely to be useful, which is what we really want when we ask our patients to come in and get these procedures done. And so, um, and so we will be presenting that data at ISHLT. The second question had to do with sex. And so the graft cohort just did an analysis of um, donor-derived cell-free DNA levels by donor and recipient sex and sex mismatch and so forth. That paper, I think, is currently under review. It was written by uh, Amanda Vest and Celia DeFilippis. They showed no difference uh, when we looked at levels by sex. Thanks. Maybe, uh, maybe I could just turn the focus right now on the infectious uh, disease screening, the idea of using the TORC virus assay. Um, this has been around for some time, Kieran, and yet we're not seeing it come forward as a potential clinical test, maybe because standardizing it is going to be a little bit difficult. Where do you stand now? Because I think that this, this is an idea which really has legs, and yet it doesn't seem to getting uptake. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of challenges. You know, as I showed in one of my slides, there are so many different subtypes of TORC tenoviruses. And so we still don't really understand which subtypes are important to monitor over time. And so different groups that have been sequencing and quantifying TORC tenoviruses or neloviruses have been looking at different combinations and different subtypes. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in these tests and what they're measuring. And so now there is an assay, a research grade assay that has tried to standardize the anelovirus testing and that's being used more and more, but it hasn't been adopted very widely. So I think a lot more work needs to be done on standardizing which virus subtypes are being quantified and then how we're quantifying and reporting these levels so that studies can be compared against one another. Daniel? Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Karan. It's always interesting to hear what you say because I learn something new every time. So uh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Uh, practical question. So I think from our perspective, kind of making sure that we use this properly because of cost is important. So two questions. One, is there an effect of steroids in terms of that? Because we know with gene expression profiling, steroids do affect the gene expression. So I'm wondering if self free DNA is affected by that. And second is the timing after transplant and biopsies as to when you can actually see the cell free DNA go back to baseline, that we can start using it again? Yeah, great question. So gene expression profiling, um, for example, the Alamap assay, which is what's clinically available in the US, there's several genes within that panel that are steroid responsive genes. So their expression is affected by high steroid doses. So you can't use the gene expression profiling test if patients are on more than 20 milligrams of prednisone a day 
The cell-free DNA assays, on the other hand, can be used regardless of steroid dosing because they're just looking at graft injury. And steroids um, won't alter the levels of uh, the cell-free DNA in the blood. So they can be used much earlier. And so what we and others have shown was that the donor-derived cell-free DNA levels start to reach a baseline level at 7 to 14 days post-transplant. So that's theoretically when you can start using the test for transplant monitoring. So Allosure right now, they say that for the company, you can start using it at 28 days post-transplant. So at Stanford, we start our first Allosure test at 28 days post-transplant. Um, now, what I have noticed is that in our heart transplant patients who have early um, restrictive physiology post-transplant, if they're still struggling with some volume overload, some graft dysfunction at that one month time point post-transplant, often that first Allosure level is high. Um, and when we biopsy them, it's negative. And then over time, as kind of that restrictive physiology volume overload resolves and the Allosure levels normalize. So it is a little bit variable based on the patient characteristics, but in general, they can be used starting at the one month time point post-transplant. And uh, after biopsies as well? So um, ideally, you don't want to draw this test within a few hours to maybe a day or two after performing a biopsy, because when you do the biopsy, you're actually causing injury to the graft, so you're releasing cell-free DNA into the blood. Same thing, actually, when we um, looked at cell-free DNA levels in our patient's blood after they had a coronary angiogram, they also had donor -derived self, higher donor-derived cell-free DNA levels. So even just, I think, the process of shooting dye down the coronary arteries that causes some shear, stress, endothelial cell, probably injury, that's releasing micro bits of cell-free DNA into the blood. So you also don't want to do the test you know, within a few hours to a day or two after a coronary angiogram. Thank you. You know, Karen, I, you you raised several issues which I think everyone would like us to follow up on. One of the issues is that it looks like in some circumstances we're not fully treating rejection and we don't adequately follow up. And when you look at the follow up after people who have had uh, kidney or heart transplants that have had a T cell mediated rejection, the outcomes are terrible, even though even though we say that's a treatable condition. And yet, I, th I think the problem is we may not be treating to baseline and we may not have a way of finding out if we're at baseline. The same thing also with treatment of cancer. So maybe one of the big applications of this will be in, in following up after treatment to see if you've neutralized the disease process. And is that how you're using it in Stanford as well uh, to monitor the effects of treatment? Yeah, so uh, there have been studies showing that you can monitor donor-derived cell-free DNA levels after you start treatment for acute rejection. And if the treatment is successful, the levels start to go down within several days of starting treatment. So I think that's very valuable because you can actually monitor response to therapy very early. And so typically what we've been doing is we'll do a follow-up biopsy two weeks after our treatment to make sure that the rejection was successfully treated. And for the most part it is, but occasionally we do have patients who continue to have acute rejection on biopsy. And at that point, their outcomes tend to be quite poor. But with a cell-free DNA assay, if you monitored response maybe every a couple of days and you saw that the levels are declining rapidly, then you can actually assess response to therapy earlier. And so I think that could be an, an important potential clinical application. We're not doing that routinely, although we probably should. And um, we're in the process of designing a clinical trial to start empiric treatment based on rising cell-free DNA levels and then using the cell-free DNA assay to monitor response to our treatment. So hopefully that will give us a better idea of um, how to best manage these patients. And the same thing with oncology. I was seeing you that case you presented with the patient who was being treated and the uh, the DNA went down, but it didn't go down all the way. And then it was followed by a recurrence. Um, I mean, that, that and then after this successful treatment of the recurrence, it went down to zero. And, and I think that's the kind of thing which sort of inspires us to think that there's a different way of managing patients that, that you can see 
the completeness of your treatment mm -hmm. and the need for further follow-up in ways that we often just leave after yeah. treatment right now. Yeah, lots of really interesting work still to do. Well, I think uh, if there are no further questions, I'd like, I'd like to take opportunity on behalf of all of us to thank you for taking the time to walk us through these many dimensions of your work. And you haven't even, oh, Laurie West has got her hand up. Laurie? Oh. <laughs> Oh, you, that was a that was just applause, Phil. That was the okay. All right, but <laughs> I just wanted I just want to say that so, so many dimensions to follow up on. I'm sure that uh, next that that we're going to have hear a lot more about this and some of these aspects that you've opened up. Maybe we should get you to come back and tell us more detail about some of these new things that you're working on because it sounds like there's a brilliant future here. And incidentally. Um, as someone who um, the oldest person as usual on the call, I'd just like to say how uh, what a pleasure it is to see the careers of some of the next generation of transplantation scientists blooming. And if you're looking for a role model, um, you should watch the career of Kieran Kush. So congratulations on your achievements and thank you very much for your contributions. Next week, we'll be uh, going through... Um, the uh, issue of uh, T-Regs, engineering T-Regs in transplantation with um, with Megan Lovings uh, from UBC. So that's also going to be very enjoyable. Again, thanks very much to everybody. Mm -hmm.